word that comes from the mouth of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. We live not only with food, but as he said, that the word of God who became flesh himself said, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And the word of God, the apostle Paul said in Hebrews, that God speaks today to us through his son. And, and because he is the word who became flesh, he is the word. We continue to hear him speak to us through the message from the word. And so let us prepare our hearts to receive the word. And let us welcome Pastor Mark. Praise God. Amen. I'm so grateful that we have the Word. Amen. Because the Word is what we build our lives upon. Amen. I cannot build it on anything else. If I don't have the Word, I'm lost. Because the Word is my rock. And I can be shaken, but the rock cannot be shaken. And when I put my trust in the Word, I stand firm. I stand strong because He holds me. I don't know with what kind of thoughts you came to the house of the Lord today, but every time we gather in His name, the Word says, I am there in the midst of you. It means Jesus is here today. You may not see Him, you may not feel Him. You may feel the exact opposite, but I can guarantee you the Word says Jesus is here today. Sometimes we want to see Him physically because at least we can see Him and we have the physical evidence. But faith is not about having the physical evidence. Faith is the substance of the things we hope for. And it is the evidence of the things we do not see. And there are many things we do not see. There are many things that we feel. And many times what we feel has to do with the work of the enemy. And we don't feel that God is working. That is why it is good to sing. As a statement of faith, I believe, Lord, that even when I don't feel it, even when I don't see it, you are working. You are working. God never stops working. And His work is to save souls. His work is to touch and change lives. His work here today in our midst is to do in your life what you need. For His glory. Amen. And when it's for His glory, it will always be for your good. Amen. I don't have to worry if God is working for my good because He is a good and a faithful Father. Amen. And He knows me. And He knows what I need. I can think that I know what I need. But God says, but I really know what you need. Sometimes our mind needs to be changed so that it gets in line with what God knows about us, with what God knows about our current state, and what God knows about our future, and that has to do with what He is working. Because He wants you and me to be involved in what He is working. When God is in the work of saving people, He wants His children to be involved in the salvation of people. That is what he has called us to be, a worker in his vineyard. The Bible says that the fields are white, they're ripened, the harvest is ripe, it's ready to be harvested. We can look at the harvest and say, well, it doesn't seem right to me, but God knows the heart of every person. He knows the person you will meet this week. He knows every single person you will meet and he knows their heart, and he knows the way to their heart, and he knows that their hearts are ready. Some hearts cannot be ready. The Lord will not bring you to the heart that is not ready. The Lord will bring you to the hearts that are ready. Amen. The hearts that are, that he's already been working on. Sometimes someone else has already planted a seed, someone else has already watered, and then you show up, and then you're the one harvesting. Sometimes you're the one planting the seed but not involved in the harvest of that person. That doesn't matter because there's a big vineyard. And there are many souls, many souls that need to be saved. And I know some of you have heard it for years and years and years that Jesus is coming back, but Jesus is coming back. 
He is coming back. Yes. Yes. And the hour is coming closer and closer. The world gets darker and darker. And that is why we need to shine brightly. We need to let the light that we have received, Jesus Christ, in our lives, in our hearts. And we need to let it shine brightly. Because there are so many people that don't know Jesus just yet. They don't know him. There is no higher calling in the ministry than to be a winner of souls. There is no higher calling. I don't care about any title you can give a person. But there is no higher calling than to be a, a winner of souls. There is nothing more spiritual and there is no greater spiritual depth than to be involved in the work of God of winning souls for Him. The greatest joy the disciples ever experienced was when souls were one. The only reason that angels celebrate in heaven is when a soul is one. That's the only reason. The only reason. That's not the word that I was supposed to share. But let's go into the word today. Because I believe the Lord has something to say. And it doesn't matter if you're a long time Christian or you consider yourself quite new in the journey of faith, it doesn't matter. God still works. And when it comes to his children, he works on the heart. God always is concerned about the hearts of his children. That's where his work takes place. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21. You can read it in your Bible, you can read it on your phone, you can read it on the screen here, whichever you prefer. But it says, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, Forever and ever. Amen. If you can say amen, that means I agree with what it says. I actually like the New King James Version a little bit better because I love it when it says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly. I mean, it's like, you know, God is bigger than our language. God is bigger than any language in the entire world. And, and when I read something like this, exceedingly abundantly above all, it's like trying to capture it with words, what God is able to do, but even words cannot really express. Amen. How wonderful he is, and, and, and how powerful he is. There is nothing that he cannot do. There is nothing he cannot understand, nothing that he cannot foresee. There is no situation in your life, in your heart, that limits God in any way to do what he wants to do. Amen. You may have come to church with your backpack full of problems and it weighs heavily on you. But whatever is in your backpack, God says that's not a problem to me. It is not. There is nothing that I cannot do. The Bible says he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Amen. Asking and thinking are always connected. Asking speaks about our prayer life. Because when you pray, I assume that there are things that you ask of the Lord. Or do you have nothing to ask Him? You have no questions for Him whatsoever. I have many things that I ask of the Lord. But what I ask always has to 
do with what I think. It has to do with my thoughts. It has to do with my desires. But it also has to do with how I, what my view of God is, what my understanding of God is, what my revelation of God is. In the way God has been able to reveal himself to me, that connects directly to what I think and what I believe of him. Amen. Sometimes I'm faced with a challenge. I mean, if like David, who was faced with Goliath, everybody else looked at that giant and listened to that giant, and in their mind they said, that's not possible. We cannot fight him. We cannot overcome him. The same with the ten spies who reported about the promised land. And they testified how beautiful it is. But in their mind they said, we cannot take this land because there are giants and the walls are too big. You know, and it had to do with their view of God. Their knowledge of God. In what measure God was able to reveal himself to them. The more time you spend in his presence. The more God is able to reveal himself to you. The more intimate acquainted you will be with him. The Bible says when Joshua went into the tent. The tent of fellowship with the Lord. Where God spoke to Moses. Joshua, his servant, was there. The moment Moses left, Joshua stayed there. Joshua saw the, the success of Moses lies in his fellowship with the Lord. It is found in the presence of God. There is no substitute for the presence of God. You can find people that know scripture better, better than you know it, better than I know it. But unless it is brought to life by the Holy Spirit, unless you live it, unless we breathe it, unless we practice it, God wants to reveal more of himself. He wants to do greater things. When the Bible says he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or think, it means that when a person is sick and I believe that God is the healer, I don't have to beg God to heal. The scripture says he has given me power and authority to speak healing in the name of Jesus. That is what the word says. God sent out his disciples and he said, lay hands on the sick and heal them. That's what it said. Many times the problem is in our thinking. Because we start wondering, what if I lay my hands and it doesn't happen? What if I pray and it doesn't happen? What if, what if, what if? What if God does it? What if I believe what the word says? What if I really put my trust in him? What if I only ask him once, believe I have received it, and then I start thanking him for it? Amen. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Because parents among you, when your child is coming to you and they ask you for something, and five seconds later, they ask the same thing. And five seconds later, they ask the same thing. And five seconds later, they ask the same thing. You will become tired of it. They've already asked that question. And you've already given your answer. It's either yes or it's no. When it's yes, they will just have to wait until you fulfill that promise, what you made. But when a parent says yes to a child, the child believes that the yes is yes. When the word of God says, I am the God that healeth thee. It means that he is the God that heals. That is his promise. 
When it says by your stripes, by the stripes of Jesus, I am healed. That is his promise. It is his word. I don't have to doubt his word. I have to put my faith in his word. And then leave it up to God how, where, when. That's up to him. Amen. But his word stands. If I build my life on his word, I have to build my life on his entire word. Not just the parts that I like or understand. His entire word. From Genesis to Revelation, all of it is true. All of it is true. Amen. And then it says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to what? Power. Amen. Power. Amen. Come on, say power. 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 <laughs> And where is that power? In us. It's in me. Amen. It's in you. Amen. You have power on the inside. Amen. Hello. Amen. You have power on the inside. Amen. That power is working in you. Amen. And that power is not just impersonal power. That power speaks of the Holy Spirit, a person alive in you. And there's nothing he doesn't know. There's nothing he cannot do. But the thing is, no matter how powerful he is, he can be limited by our faith. Lack of faith, I should say. He can be limited by our unbelief. He can be limited by our doubts. He can be limited by our decisions. That is why John the Baptist says he needs to increase and I need to decrease. That is why Paul said, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. It speaks of surrender. It speaks of allowing the Holy Spirit to take control and do what only He can do. There is a power working in us. I think many times we don't realize that, that the Holy Spirit is actually living in us. Because when we, when we would fully realize that the Holy Spirit, a person, not just a force, a person, the third person of the Trinity, lives inside of us, it would affect everything in our lives. It would affect the words we use, the way we speak of others, because the Holy Spirit who lives in us hears everything. He knows everything. We can close our door, we can close the curtains, we can make it as dark as we want, and we can speak in secret, but the Holy Spirit is in us. Amen. And the Holy Spirit is God. Amen. So God knows. There is no limit to what the Holy Spirit can do. It is by that same power that Jesus was raised from the dead. And that power lives in you and me. That power works in you and me. And that power works. The Holy Spirit works. And the work that he does has to do with our heart and our character. Amen. That's the inside work that he does. That is what he works in every believer. That is why sometimes it is quite difficult for us. Because he starts to deal 
with our character. Mm -hmm. And we all know our character. We don't need anyone else to tell us what our character is because we will be offended when someone else tells us. But we know it all too well ourselves. And the Holy Spirit knows. And when we allow the Holy Spirit to work the work that He wants to do in us, He will start pointing out things that need change. Amen. And when He starts to point out things that need change, you come to the point that you say, no matter how bad I want to change it, I don't have the power to change it. You have to allow Him to do that. But I can tell you this, the more time you spend in the presence of God, the more you will become subject to change. The less time you spend in the presence of God, the less you will be subject to change. The more you will hold on to what we hold dear. What we consider as good attributes in our life. But even the good in our life, the Bible says, it is nothing to God. That's not what we like to hear, but we, because many times we're proud of the good attributes that we have in our lives. But the Bible says it's all filthy rags to the Lord. Mm -hmm. True. Even the good that is in us is filthy to the Lord. Mm -hmm. Because God is holy. And He says, be holy for I am holy. When the Holy Spirit works in us, He doesn't just do a work inside of us to change us. Just so that we are polished up and look beautiful. But He equips us and He works in us so that we can become a vessel of honor. To be filled with Him, but to also pour out into the world that is dying without Him. God wants to use each and every one of us in His kingdom. Everyone has a place in the vineyard. Everyone. Everyone has received gifts and talents from the Lord. Even if it's only one, that doesn't matter. But we have received them from the Lord to use it for His glory. Now you might say, yeah, that's all nice, but you don't know the things that I'm going through. You don't know anything about my past. You don't know the hurts that I carry inside. And there are believers today, and you know the Lord for many years already, but there are still things that you carry inside your hearts that you have not surrendered to the Lord. It has caused pain. It has caused grief. You carry it. You try to manage it. You try to deal with it. And you've been surviving. And you're proud of that. That you have made it this far. You can even say, thus far the Lord has brought me. But there comes a point that God says, but if you think this is the end of the road for you, I've got news for you. I'm not done with you yet. There are greater things that I want to do in your life. There are greater things that I want to do through your life. But for me to be able to do that, you need to surrender that. Sometimes it has to do with what people have said or done to you. Sometimes it has to do with you grew up without a father or a mother. Sometimes you grew up with a parent that abused you. Many things can have happened in your past. And it has created a wound 
or it has created a hole in your life, a void that you said, I really missed that. And because I missed that part in growing up, I still struggle with that today. Wow, the message is old. The Bible says, God knows exactly what you need. Mm -hmm. Amen. Matthew 6, 8. It's way at the end somewhere. For your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask Him. He knows what you need. The Bible says in Psalms 68, verse 5, A father of the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy habitation. There can be all kinds of reasons that we have wounds in our hearts, that we have pain, that we have grief. The world tells you time heals all wounds. I tell you time doesn't do that. But God can use the time to heal all your wounds. Amen. It is only God who heals. I've heard a preacher say once, it might be the scar. And some scars are painful. And some scars are not. The reason a scar can be painful is because Time has passed. You have tried to find closure about something. And eventually, when the world says time will heal all wounds, we know that every wound at some point will close and there will be a scar. But when we have not surrendered it to the Lord, that scar will always bring painful memories. We don't want to touch it anymore. We don't want to talk about it anymore. We don't want to be reminded of it. We hide it under layers of clothes. Some people, even during the summer when it's really hot, they will still wear long sleeve because <laughs> the scars need to be covered. And we can cover many things, but the pain is still underneath. The difference happens when, when you allow the Lord to work in that area where you carry that scar, where it's painful, where the memory just opens up. It feels like it rips open that wound and it's fresh again. But when you allow the Lord to work there, He starts to heal. And sometimes it still leaves a scar. But the scar speaks no longer of the painful memory. The scar speaks of how God has healed you. We are not without scars in life. None of us are without scars in life. Jacob walked for the rest of his life with a limp. But the limb testified of his encounter with God. Every day it reminded him, I have been so close to God, so intimate with God. Oh, I pray that today the Lord is able to touch you where you carry that scar, that he can heal you, that he can restore you. That you allow him to do that. And then when you look at that scar, you will say, oh yes, I carry that scar. But this scar speaks of what God has done in my life. He has healed me. He took away that pain. Oh, and now I can testify, look at what the Lord has done in my life. The Lord knows what you need. We are not without scars. Our scars may be all different. Our pasts are not the same. But God knows every detail. 
He knows everything. He knows everything about you. Psalms 103 verse 14 says, For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. Paul speaks to the Corinthians. I believe it's in 2 Corinthians 4. It's not there, it's okay. And he says, we carry this treasure in earthen vessels. The treasure is precious. The power that works in you, it is the Holy Spirit. It is precious. He's so precious. But he lives inside an earthen vessel. An earthen vessel is fragile. It has its weaknesses. Oh, we have so many weaknesses. We have so many flaws. But all the flaws and all the weaknesses didn't stop God from moving in. Amen. He knew his habitation would be an earthen vessel. He knew I'm living inside of a flawed person. A weak person, a scarred person, a damaged person. But I chose to live there. He chose to live inside of you. He didn't come to live inside of you because you were perfect. He came to live inside of you because he loves you and you responded to that love. And now he starts to work inside of us. Still knowing our frame. Still knowing that we are dust. Because Psalms 139 verse 13 says, For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you. For I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Listen, this has to do with your thinking here. Above all we ask or think. This is speaking of how we are supposed to think. I will praise you because although I am an earthen vessel, I am fragile, I am weak, I have my flaws, I have my scars, I have my pain, but Lord, you made me. And not just made me, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works. Marvelous are your works. The power that works in me, the work that he is doing, it is marvelous. You are his masterpiece. You are work in progress, but you are his masterpiece. He delights in you because he created you fearfully, wonderfully. And it's important that my soul knows that very well. That your soul knows. Your soul, that's where, that's where you feel. Your soul, that's who you are. This is just the outside. I'm a white ball God. That's the outside. This is the package that I carry for as long as I live. This is the package that one day I will lay down. When this package dies, I'm not dead. I'm alive. I just leave this. And he made me, but he knows that I'm dust. He created me, and I will go back to dust. This, this body will go back to dust. But this body is not me. This is just so that you recognize me. If you would not see this body, you would see nothing. But who I am is, is on the inside. It's my soul. My soul never dies. And my soul needs to know that God created me. That God saw my formless beginning. Even before I was created in my mother's womb, God saw me. God saw me. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret, skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. 
And in your book they all were written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there was none of them. Oh, hallelujah. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. A little less than two weeks from now, there will be elections in the U.S. I'm glad I didn't have to vote there. <laughs> but whatever country you're from, God's children have the responsibility to vote for whatever party or platform is closest in line with the Word of God. That's the responsibility of God's children. Governments can be corrupt. You can blame it all on the government, but I blame it on God's children who do not take their responsibility to vote. Who do not take their responsibility to pray. Because governments have always done whatever they wanted to do. But if we do not vote, we allow things to happen. If you're looking for the perfect politician that is 100% in line with the Word of God, keep looking, you will never find him or her. But you also will never find a pastor who is 100% perfect. You will also not find a bishop who is 100% perfect. You will also not find an apostle who is 100% perfect. Because there are none. Mm. But please pray for America. Because whether we like it or not, they're a big player in what happens in the world. And you may think it's far from where I live. But it will have its effect in the decisions being made on a global platform. It will have its effect. Pray that God's children will take their responsibility. That was a side note here. When we look at scripture, and it says how God saw everything, our formless beginning, that He created us, that He formed us, that we were fearfully and wonderfully made. This is how God looks at you. This is what we need to understand as God's children. This is how God started with you. And what He started, He will finish. He started something good in your life. No matter what has happened in all the years that you're alive right now, God created you. God saw your formless beginning. God made you fearfully and wonderfully. His work is still marvelous. His work is still good. Every day he already counted before any of them ever began. Even the bad days he knew. Even the bad days he was there. Even that day that you were abused, even that day that you were hurt, even that day, even that day, even that day, God was there. God knows. The enemy will remind you of all your weaknesses, of all your flaws. He will constantly try to remind you of the scar and the pain that you carry and what people have said to you. Oh, how difficult it is sometimes for people to just shake off what other people say. Some Christians are just... They're happy one moment... And the next moment, something is being said, and they're all over their face. They crumble to the floor. They cry. They, they complain. They stop coming. They stop serving. They stop. They cry out to God. But you know, 
There are times in life as a parent that you just need to say to your children, come on, get up. You can cry and cry. Does that help you? Get up. Pull yourself together. Focus on what the Word of God says. God loves you. Praise the Lord. If someone talks negative about you, who cares? They will always find a reason to say something. You cannot please everyone. You're not called to please everyone. You're called to please the Lord. Amen. Amen. The enemy reminds you of your weaknesses. Why does he do that? Because he wants you to end up in depression. When you're in depression, you have no faith. When you have no faith, you cannot overcome. You will not receive anything from the Lord. The promises are still there, but because you have no faith, you don't receive it. What does God say? Pastor Bong said it before. When the devil came, what did Jesus say? He responded with the word. What does God say? Second. Second Corinthians 12, verse 9 and 10. He said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Wait a minute. What does that mean? Lord, I want you to take away my weakness. Lord, I want you to strengthen me there so that I won't be weak anymore. God says, forget it. The weakness is my portal that I will use to show forth my strength. If you don't have any weakness anymore, what am I to do? You will just rely on yourself that you think you can do it all yourself now. Paul understood. He struggled with this. You know, the great apostle Paul, he struggled with this. I have this thorn in my flesh. I asked the Lord, take it away from me. He said, I've asked it three times. Why not four? Why not five? Why not six? The Bible doesn't say the, the, the time span of the three times he asked that question. But I can tell you this. There comes a point... That God, when your heart is sincere, will answer you. And his answer is very simple. If you want me to take away that thorn that you're carrying, if you want me to take away that scar, I can use that scar for my glory. Amen. If that is the bigger purpose, Lord, please don't take away the scar. Do you understand what I'm saying here? We can ask the Lord to remove everything. That hurts us and that is painful. He will not remove everything. He will heal. He will restore. But he will remind us of it so that it can be used for his glory. The devil will remind you of it to bring you down. But God can use that for his glory. Paul said that for now is not a problem to me anymore. It was a problem before, but now it's no longer a problem because God answered me and now I understand that I have to be thankful for this weakness. I will even boast in my weakness because that will bring glory to Him. Amen. Oh Lord, use that weakness for your glory. It is completely turned upside down. You may think, yes, but there are things in my life that still affect me to today. I cannot see how God can use me with that problem, with that pain, with that issue. I cannot see how God can repair that in my life. Psalms 103, reading from verse 8, says, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. 
He has not dealt with us according to our sins, mm -hmm. nor punished us according to our iniquities. Mm -hmm. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Whatever sin, whatever mistake, Whatever it is, he has removed it so far that even if you want to find it with your eye and you have the best vision in the world, you cannot find it. You cannot see it. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. For again, he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. As a flower of the field, so he flourishes, for the wind passes over it, and it is gone. That's our life. That's how quickly it goes. And he holds that in his hand. And he looks at you, and he says, you have no idea how much I love you and how precious you are to me. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting everlasting Amen. on those who fear him. His righteousness to children's children, to such as keep his covenant and to those who remember his commandments to do them. That's your part. That's my part. To do what he says. To read his word and do what he says. To put my whole trust in him. Yes, that also means the power that works in me. I need to allow the Holy Spirit to touch those areas in my life that are painful, that are hurtful, that I have kept closed, protected. Nobody can touch it. Nobody can reach there. It's hidden in the corner. It doesn't bother me. You know, you can... I remember I visited this former colleague once, bought a new apartment, brand new, everything, beautiful. So we were there with a group of colleagues and she showed us around all the rooms and then there was one room. She said, no, we're not going to go in there. Why not? It's a mess in there. Everything, all the clutter, she gathered it and put it in that one room so she could show off the entire apartment but not that one room and sometimes we're like that sometimes we're like that this is a strategy that is used many many times the most famous football player that we have in the Netherlands ever in history is Johan Cruyff. When he became a coach, he said, I'm very aware, well, I'm aware of my, the team flaws, the team that I'm coaching. But it is my job to show the strengths of my team to the opponent and hide the flaws behind the strengths. If I just show the strengths, they will be amazed about the strengths, but they will not focus on the flaws. We hide our flaws by showing our strengths, by showing our talents, by showing what we're good at. But God says, listen, I have bigger things and greater things. But the weaknesses that you're trying to hide, the pain that you're trying to hide, the hurt that you're trying to bury, it's a problem. You may put it in a corner, you may put it far away, you can enjoy the rest of the room, but you will always know. If you have that one room in your house that is a big mess, you can close the door. It doesn't bother you, but you know it's there. You know it's there. And some people have no problem with knowing it's there. They can just live with it and, and they're not bothered by it. Some people, it will frustrate 
<laughs> and they will have to clean it. But when it comes to the Lord and what He can do, He, he doesn't allow rooms like that. Amen. He doesn't allow it. But even when we made a mistake, maybe it's past mistakes, maybe it's recent mistakes. Even when we make mistakes, God is a God of second chances. Amen. And third chances. And fourth chances. You can always go back to Him. You can always go back to God. The thoughts that God has toward you and me, Psalms 139, verse 17 and 18, how precious also are your thoughts to me. Listen, this is what God says. This speaks about how God thinks about you. You, the earthen vessel, the fragile vessel, the vessel with the scar, the vessel maybe that has a crack somewhere, the vessel that is weak. He looks at you and his thoughts are precious. How great is the sum of them. So not just one thought, many thoughts, many thoughts. All his thoughts towards you are good are good. Yes, Lord, but no, I love you. Yes, Lord, but no. You see, that's the fatherly love. He doesn't love us any less when we make a mistake. When the Bible says, there is nothing that can separate me from the love of God. Nothing. Not even my sin. My sin does not separate me from His love. It separates me from His presence, not from His love. And when I have sinned, He is merciful. He is full of love. And He is willing to forgive when I repent. And then when His blood washes away my sins, then that presence is available for me again. But His love has always been there. This is important to know because it means that whatever you carry in your life, whatever wounds, whatever pain you have, whatever difficulties, no matter how you may look at yourself and say, yes, but I'm not able to do that. No, the Lord cannot use me to do that. Oh no, I've messed up too much. No, this is not good. That is not good. God says, listen, that's not a problem. Just surrender it to me. Just allow me to do in your life what only I can do. There is a power working in you. Allow that power to do what it needs to do, what it wants to do. The more we allow him, the more he can do. In us, but also through us. I need to close. The power that works in us is the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit, Spirit works in us. We find it in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. It means when there is no law against it, there is no condemnation. You understand that? These things that the Spirit of God works in us are exactly opposite to the desires of your flesh. And the desires of the flesh they're not there to be polished up, shine brightly, improved, updated, upgraded. All of that does not apply to the desires of the flesh. Even the good qualities that you may have. Because let's be honest, some people are not Christian, but they're very loving. Or they're very kind. They give generously. It doesn't come from the Holy Spirit, but it is in their DNA somewhere to just do that. However, 
the glory will never go to the Father. Yes. But these are the, this is the fruit that speaks of the character of Jesus Christ. This is the character of God. This is what the Holy Spirit wants to develop in our lives. And in order for the Holy Spirit to work that in us, He will allow things to happen for us to practice it. Because you can only learn things and grow things if you practice it. Practice makes perfect, right? Mm -hmm. Without practice, nothing happens. Mm -hmm. So when it speaks of love, it means you will be in a situation where the flesh will become, wants to become angry, but the Holy Spirit wants to respond in love. And when you allow the Holy Spirit to do that, you can even find yourself in a position that instead of becoming angry, you respond in love. And after your response, like you're like, what? What, what? what just happened? Normally, I would be so angry right now. But now I was able to respond in love? Amazing. This is what the Holy Spirit can do. Joy. Something happens in my life, and instead of complaining, I find myself smiling and praising God. That is joy working in you. What else? Peace. Instead of being stressed about situations, you find yourself sleeping so well. Because you have perfect peace. And you're like, I used to stress out about things like that, but now you have peace because you know the Lord is in control. Patience. Ooh, I want to have patience. And I want it now. Yes. Patience is something very tricky, very difficult. It is something that it comes over time. So we want the problem fixed right now. We want the, the problem to disappear. We want God to step in, remove it, make smooth the road ahead. But God says, you're on a journey and I'm teaching you patience. Lord, how long will it be? You know, every time you ask how much longer, it means you have not reached that point that you have grown in patience. But there will come a day when you allow the Holy Spirit to work in you, and it's being put to the test, and all of a sudden you realize, when I pray, I don't, I don't pray about that as much as I used to. You know, you come to a point that when you're impatient, every pair of prayer is about that thing that you're struggling with. And when you entrust the Lord, and, and sometimes you have to say that a thousand times a day. You surrender it to the Lord. And again, and again, and again. When he tries, you become anxious. No, 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 Lord, here it is. But there comes a day that all of a sudden you don't have to surrender it a thousand times. You only surrender it 500 times. Or a hundred times. And then 10 times. And then all of a sudden, you're praying about other things, but no longer about that thing that bothered you so much. You just know the Lord will do it. Show kindness when people are unfriendly to you. There are many people that are unfriendly nowadays. You can find them everywhere. So you have a lot of opportunity to show kindness. Be good to others when they, you, when they treat you badly. Show faithfulness when others walk away. Ah, that's also a tricky one. Because you know when people have an employer and they have a fixed job, they will not walk away that easily. 
But when it comes to church and when it comes to ministry, when something happens and they don't like it, <laughs> it happens many times because we still regard serving the Lord as voluntary work. Be gentle while others deal harshly with things. Have self-control instead of losing our temper. If you're known for losing your temper, something needs to grow. Oh, I see some finger pointing there. I will not look at the one who did that. <laughs> but this is the nature of God's children. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. This is what we need to allow Him to do in us. And it all starts with just surrendering to Him. Just surrendering to Him. I'm grateful I'm just the one sharing the message. I'm not the one who knows exactly what's going on. But I do know that every time I prepare and every time I pray, that I believe the Lord puts it in my heart. And I know today the Lord gave me this word because there are some people who carry things in their heart, in their life, where God says, but it's time to deal with it. It is time to deal with it. And when you allow me to deal with it, you will get to know me in a more intimate way. I will be able to reveal myself to you in a new way. And the moment I am able to reveal myself to you in a new way, your thinking will start to change. And when your thinking starts to change, your prayers will start to change. You will start to pray with a new kind of faith because I've revealed myself in a new way to you. I have healed you of something that you thought that was beyond repair. God knows you. Make no mistake. There's nothing you can hide from Him. But let that thought not scare you. Let that thought encourage you today that if He knows and he still says, but I love you. And he still says, but I live inside of you. That means that whatever you are so afraid of or so scared of or what is so painful, and God knows already about it, he says, but I don't walk away from you because I know that's in your heart and your life. I just want to heal you there. I just want to touch you there. That thing that you thought you just had to live with, I can, I can do a miracle there. That's not your limit. I'm a limitless God. So while all eyes are closed this morning, and I'm not going to beg here today. God knows you. God knows your heart. He knows where you come from. He knows your past. He knows everything. And God says, I'm right here. My word says two or three gathered in my name. I am there. And where I am, I can work miracles. I can do what you've been longing for. For all these years, I can do that. And I can do it right now. Because I'm right here. Will you allow me? Will you allow me to do the miracle in your heart, in your mind, in your soul? Because that will bring forth a change that is beyond what you ever asked or thought. And I will be able to, to do things through your life, to bless people around you, to bring salvation to people around you. In your sphere of influence, I can do that. I want to do that. I want to use you for that purpose. And you will find fullness of joy. You 
want that today? It's available here today. I ask you simply to just stand up where you are. I'm not going to ask you to come to the altar here. Just simply where you're seated right now. Just stand up in the presence of God. Showing to the Lord, Lord, this is what I want. Lord, this is what I need. Lord, I have hidden it in my life. I have even maybe cherished it in my life. Or you have struggled with it in your life. It still causes pain. And you don't know how to deal with it. But God is here. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your presence. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your love. I thank you that you know us. That you have formed us. That nothing is hidden from you. And I thank you, Lord, for all your children that are standing in your presence today. Holy Presence. Father, I thank you for the power that is working in them. For the Holy Spirit that is working right now. For the Holy Spirit that pointed out things in their hearts and their lives. And pointed out and said, I need you to surrender this. Lord, by standing in your presence, we say, Lord, here we are. We surrender. We surrender. We surrender our hurt. We surrender our pain. Lord, we allow you and we ask you to come and heal us. Come and restore us. Come and fill that void, Lord. Oh, Lord, do what only you can do today. Father, I thank you that you who has begun a good work in us will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Yes, Lord, we know we are still work in progress. Father, we know that we are still this earthen vessel. We know that we will still make mistakes. We know that there will still be moments that we might struggle with things. Father, thank you that as we put our trust in you, as we put our trust in your word, and your word says, the power that is working Oh, Lord, that we learn to listen to the Holy Spirit. That we will be led by the Holy Spirit. That we will trust the instructions of the Holy Spirit. That we get to know the Holy Spirit in a more intimate and personal way. Knowing that everywhere we go, you are with us. You are for us. You are working in us. And Lord, you are working through us. Father, bless your children as they receive, as they receive right now in Jesus' name. Bless your children. And by faith we believe we have received it, Lord. Father, we give you glory, we give you honor, we give you praise. Oh, there are not words enough to thank you for the work that you are doing in us. Oh, what an amazing grace that you have saved us. What a love, Lord, that you want to use us for your glory. Oh, what a love, Lord, that you want to change our character. That the fruit of the Holy Spirit may just grow inside of us. So that all the world will see how good, how amazing you are. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And amen. Yes.